what would what would be the uh, the what would be the Thomas Madden origin story? <laughs> well, I, I would say that uh, I'm I'm a guy who kind of wrote himself into his career. I mean, it's uh, it's always started with with writing, and that's how I started. Uh, my first job was a journalist. I was a reporter for the Philadelphia Inquirer, and from there. It just kept on going. I wrote myself right to New York, and I wrote myself right into the top of the networks. And it was really my writing that uh, made this pathway for me. That is such a, a testament to writing. I, you know, more recently, the whole phrase of uh, content is king is become popular. But my days go back to uh, in television. And, you know, I used to always people used to ask me, well, who's the best anchor man in town and blah, 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 blah. You know, and I say, well, it can be the best in the world. But, you know, it all comes down to the writing. <laughs> it's true. It's true. And, you know, and I uh, and I and it's resulted now in, you know, in Five books. I've written five books. I've probably written about 10,000 blogs and, I don't know, hundreds of articles. And, you know, so uh, I am I am constantly coming up with ideas for writing. And uh, once I have the idea, it yanks me by the neck and pulls me to the laptop. And I have no else to do but to write. <laughs> So something that uh, is uh, on the surface right now, I notice, is uh, mad mischief. So it sounds like it describes you pretty well. Well, yes, uh, uh, I started mad mischief a number of years ago. Boy, we must be up to I don't know how many, maybe a several thousand blogs by now. But it's it's been wonderful for me. It's first of all, it's great therapy. You know, if I get very upset about things, uh, you know, I feel a little relieved after I write about them. So it is good therapy to write. And uh, and some of my books, I mean, one of my books was uh, a very affectionate book. It's called The Love Boat 78. Uh, that was the my age when I wrote it. And uh, it came following the, the death of my first wife. Uh, and I was so, you know, uh, dis distraught and lonely and, and really in a lot of pain because we had been married for, uh, you know, 50 plus years. And, uh, and I just didn't know how to live without her. I'm so sorry to hear that. Uh, tell me what transpired or how you overcame that. Well, I did some foolish things. I, 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 you know, I wasn't really thinking that clearly, uh, you know, all of a sudden uh, losing her, Angela. And uh, and some of my friends said, why don't you why don't you try to meet other other women and uh, you know try these dating services and uh, you know i'm living alone and i'm not comfortable being alone so yeah i started going on a few of these services and then some bizarre things happen you know i have i now i have all these contacts uh, interested in me i look like i have a few bucks i'm an older guy <laughs> i look like a perfect target so women were writing back to me saying, uh, you know, from as far away as Australia, saying they'd like to come in and meet me, you know. And I, I said, well, uh, I don't know whether you want to do, take that, that long of a trip, you know, you, you know, just for that possibility that we might connect. So, but, and then I started actually going out with a few, with a few of my contacts on these dating services and, uh, I mean, they were very strange, awkward. I, I didn't feel relaxed, and and I could tell some of the women were like they had me targeted. Uh, you know, I, I just felt uncomfortable being, you know, in the crosshairs. So you weren't living the dream. No, 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 and uh, you know, and, and this went on for I don't know a couple of years, and uh, 
And then after searching all over the wide world for, uh, you know, uh, a roommate, another uh, uh, someone I could live with, I walk into this neighborhood bar, oh, lunchtime, uh -huh. and I see this woman, beautiful blonde hair, uh, sitting across from me on the bar, and I, and I, and I couldn't help, you know, like I raised my glass and I toasted her, you know, and she toasted back, and, and I was with a client at the time, and I asked, I excused myself. I said, I just have to go say hello to this, this lovely person over there. He says, go ahead, go ahead. So I walked over, and uh, and I met Rita. And she was so, so friendly and interesting, and she had an accent. I asked her where she's from, and she said, Brazil. Brazil. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So I, you know, we started chatting and I asked for her number and I said, I'd like to call her. And, you know, and she, um, she called my phone. So I had her number and, uh, and, and she had to leave. She had only stopped in cause she was thirsty and she had a, actually had a, a, a soda, nothing, not even hard liquor or anything, mm -hmm. but and she left. And yeah, and then the next night I called her, and from that point on, I fell in love with this girl. And a, a few months later, married her. What a story! So it's never too late. No, it isn't, and uh, and we're we've been happily married now for about four years, and and it's it's been wonderful. She is she's just a delight. She's so intelligent, you know. She, you know anybody who speaks several languages, you know that their brain is is really functioning. Yeah, uh, I'm still learning English, by the way. You know, so uh, but she she manages money. Unbelievably, I mean, mm. I, I, you know, I'm not really good at invoicing. You know, those are things my my first wife did for me, and while I wrote, someone else did the invoicing, you know, and all and the bookkeeping and all those things. I hate that stuff. And here, Rita brings these skills into my life, besides her beauty and her personality, her energy. She brought, he just, just brought my life back to life. That's beautiful. Well, as you know, uh, we are, what we want to do is we want to run these little thought provoking segments with you and um, people can get more insight into uh, Thomas Madden, or you can provide some insight into life, or maybe that's asking too much from anybody, but anyway, uh, we can all learn. Um, so is there a, uh, is there a moral to the story? <laughs> is there a moral to the story? Uh, well, uh, you know, we started with the writing and so forth. And, uh, and, and, and I think that's been a big part of my life and, uh, and it continues to be, I am always getting ideas to write something and it winds up coming out in my blog on Mad Mischief or or could even result in, in a book. In fact, my latest book is about writing. Uh, it's called The Word Shine Man. And uh, I, uh, you know, at my age, my I, I'm more of the chairman of the board type in my firm that I started. And my daughter, my dynamic daughter, Adrian. Adrian. Uh -huh. She, uh, you know, she's really running the show. <clears throat> she's really good. She's got great personality, and uh, all the clients love her, and so forth. And uh, and then every once in a while, I'll get a press release or, or a pitch letter to the media or something, and she'll say, "Dad, can you polish this? Polish it? Well, that's a strange word to use. Polish." Whenever she says that, and she uses that term over and over again, uh, because we have a lot of interns, we have young people in, in our firm, 
And uh, writing is not one of their top skills. I mean, they're really good with the with the with the cell phones, and they can text like a you know a dynamo uh, with furious fingers on a, on, a, on their phones. But when it comes to really writing something out, um, it, it, it's not one of their strengths. Are we lacking something uh, in a more general basis, or how would what would you? I think that, that I think that when I remember myself, I used to write a lot, uh, you know, write le- letters and and so forth, and even in longhand. Uh, I remember writing, and uh, then when we had the the old clunky typewriter, uh, <laughs> I would use that, you know. And uh, but now, speed and technology has changed it all. Mm-hmm. It is now, you know, how fast you can reply, uh, and how many, and and fewer words as possible. And and a lot of young people are very adept at that. I mean, they're they're great at, at quickly, you know, like getting a message off, fired out, and so forth. <clears throat> but when it comes to writing with some depth and uh, covering uh, a, a more lengthy uh, a topic, this is where they need the the polisher. <laughs> and when and Adrian it calls me the uh, the polisher, it made me think of you know. I don't. I don't mean to sound racist or anything, but they, we used to call boot blacks in in railroad stations and bus stations. I mean, these are we guys who would most of them would be black guys, and they would uh, shine shoes. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And you know, you're you're waiting for your train, your bus. And, you know, you yeah, get a shoe shine. You know, and you flip the guy a tip and right. all that. And these were fun guys. Some of them sang while they did it, you know, and they, they, were, they had lots of uh, personality. And then I, I took that that uh, polishing shoes to to my book cover, and I call it the Word Shine Man. So instead of shining shoes, I'm shining words. And, Dad, will you polish this? Oh, I'll, sh- I'll polish it. I'll shine it. <laughs> and I shine words, and uh, you know, and that's that's one of the main things I do now in 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 our firm because I see writing doesn't have the the writing skills are not as there as as they used to be, and you know when I was in college, and uh, so I think I'm adding you know some very necessary uh, instruction at the same time. I'm turning some of these uh, writings into effective pitches because writing has to accomplish something. Yeah, okay? and I think that's kind of a learned skill. I mean, uh, we, the, ideally, you learn it uh, as much as you can, the basics in, in college, but as far as uh, some of your level of writing, uh, that's something that comes from just on the job, learning it that way. Oh, yeah. No. And uh, I wanted to share with you, uh, this, is, this is Word Shine Man. Ah, okay. okay. Yeah. Okay. And this is the first book I've written that starts with a poem. Ah. And if you don't mind, I, yeah. it's just a short poem. I have great, yes. And it's a, it's about the word shine man and what he does uh, with words and so forth. I'll, I'll read to you if you, don't, yeah. if you like. <clears throat> once, once shoes, now words need polish, hence the word shine man cometh. Here it goes. You want words to tell her you love her, but not so many that'll smother? Here's what I advise you, brother. Go see the word shine, man. (laughs) Once scuffed dirty shoes needed polish. Nowadays, its words won't shine. So I tell you, bro, consult a word pro. Go see the word shine, man. A magician with words is he. Reels them out with glee, not free. You slap some grease in his hand, and he's yours, the word shine man. Last paragraph. Prose he comes up with, 
will scintillate. She'll know you're her number one fan. Never too late for love to percolate. Go see the word shy man. One more. He prefers present tense, puts wordy behind a fence, keeps it nice and tight, tells verbose, take a hike. Nothing too flowery, not on his salary. Got a message to deliver? He'll rev his motorbike. He's the word shine, man. <laughs> so important. And that, can I, I'll okay. give you an applause for that, by the way. I think that's, uh, <laughs> that's really, really great. Oh, and, yeah, it's fun. It's fun. I enjoyed that. Yes. <laughs> um, and a lot of people who come to um, our site, this was the show, uh, who I talk to, have aspirations to write. Um, and uh, I don't think there's any easy answer to what makes good writing, but because uh, there's a lot of factors that go into it. But is there kind of a takeaway that uh, maybe you might share for folks who, uh, you know, have some kind of a writing ambition uh, in them? Well, <clears throat> you know, uh, the thing that I'm always uh, uh, focused on is that uh you know writing if it if it doesn't strike a chord right up front uh it, it, the chances of it being effective or accomplishing its goal uh, it dwindles so uh, that's the importance of uh you know and in, in, in emails and so forth we have these subject lines that subject line better click interest or you are, are going to be up the creek. <laughs> so that's what I'm saying. It's the headline. It's the subject line. It's those few words that better grab attention or the rest of it is just going to waste away. And that comes from a guy who has been with ABC and NBC and uh, a major uh, PR firm and and those that's a pretty valuable lesson I would say. I think so, and, and it's my skill at writing that got me uh, into all of those opportunities. Uh, I mean, I uh, I went right from uh, you know journalism, uh, and I went to New York, and uh, I, uh, I I got a job at one of the largest. Uh, PR firms uh, at the at that time, a firm called Dudley Anderson Yutzi, and uh, and because I the the owner of the firms the, the powers there recognized that I had writing skills from all my journalistic background, they assigned me their largest client, which was the Kellogg's company, hmm. the cereal company in sure. Battle Creek, Michigan. <laughs> yes, absolutely. So. Um, I uh, I wrote at the time uh, the, the FTC was trying to break up the, the the largest cereal companies because they were called an oligopoly, oh. and the FTC wanted to break them up, and uh, they had to get rid of some of their popular brands uh, and downsize because they were too powerful. They, you know, you go into a supermarket and there were like three companies that controlled the whole, all the shelves of the supermarkets. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, they were on television on the three networks back then. Uh, they were, they were right. all keeping those, those right. companies right. going. <clears throat> well, my job was to, to derail the government's effort to, uh, you know, break them up. And I, I I wrote speeches for you know the chairman of Kellogg's his name is Bill Lamoth and uh, and uh, some some of the speeches that I wrote got reprinted in the New York Times and that was such pleasure for him the chairman of Kellogg's company and the rest of the company out in Battle Creek to get into the powerful New York Times. You know, 
my name wasn't on the speech, but his name was on the speech. Sure, he sure. delivered the speech. I'm, I'm just a writer. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, uh, I'll never forget the time that after one of my, uh, you know, I, I used the I used the term. I, I didn't say just breaking up. Uh, you know, these major, uh, you know, co major companies. I told them about, you know, what they were planning to do was to really to hurt Tony the Tiger. <laughs> That's what that I brings mean. it right home into the kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> Poor Tony the Tiger. I wrote a whole speech, you know, saying that's what they want to do. They just want to yank him out of there and, and Battle Creek and put him out to pasture. And, you know, how f unfair to Tony the Tiger. Children love him, he loves the kids, he's nourishing them. <laughs> Save Tony the Tiger. Tony the Tiger. So I, I personalized it like that. So anyway, it really home. clicked. Yeah. I got a lot of the, you know, a lot of press, and 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 of course the New York Times reprint was very impressive. And the chairman of Kellogg's was was so grateful. Uh, he called me. He says, I, "I'm going. I'm going to. I'm flying into New York. I want to take you out." I said, "Oh, well, boy, Mr. Lamont, I mean, the chairman." I said, well, thank you. And he did. He got in his private plane. He came into Manhattan. And I said, well, boy, he's going to take me probably to the best place for dinner. <laughs> so he calls me up and he said, uh, well, I'll meet you at the Plaza Hotel for breakfast. For breakfast. <laughs> oh, not quite what you had in mind. Yeah. Breakfast? Uh, uh, well, okay. Breakfast at the Plaza Hotel. I, the Plaza was the easy place in Manhattan at, at, at the time. It was. It was. A, it was at an upscale place. Oh, the Plaza Hotel, yeah. number one, right? Yeah, off I think Central I stayed Park. there once. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it was you know, top of the line. And uh, anyway, so we go to the Plaza Hotel. We have breakfast and. Uh, and he tells me how how you know fond of my writing is and how how important it was and what, and what did he, I did a great job for the company and then he told me about one of the, 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 the one of the the goals of of his stewardship of the company was to put more raisins in a raisin brand that was what he was committed to and I said well that's noble that's really you know, more raisins and raisin bran, that, that would be, that would be terrific. So I'm talking about raisin bran, all, all the breakfast and so forth and, and so forth. And, and uh, at the time I was, you know, I was working for this Dudley Anderson UT and they liked the way I, I, I treated some of their mobile clients. And uh, I'll never forget the time they asked me uh, to take the governor of, of Idaho out. Uh, for dinner they thought i would be the great guy there because i could really talk and so forth and and one of one of our clients besides kellogg's was idaho potatoes oh. so i took uh the governor to this nice restaurant upper east side and we sit down and uh and i ordered and i said uh you know and, and I told the waiter, I said, make sure the potatoes are Idaho potatoes. He said, sir, we don't have Idaho potatoes. We have only Long Island potatoes. And the governor, he laughed and so <laughs> forth. I was a little embarrassed. I should have done some research. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, we, 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 he ate the Long Island potatoes along with his meal and so forth. And we had a good time together. But but those those were wonderful days, and uh, and they're in my memory, and uh, and they're in writing, uh, all types of writing over my life. Well, you know, you're full of energy and uh, motivated. Uh, what drives you? What 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 is it about you that keeps you so engaged? I, I like to accomplish goals, and uh, and lots of times uh, my goals are connected to what I'm doing. You know, like I when I went to uh, 
work for the networks. It was actually writing uh, something. The guy who was head of public relations at, at American Broadcast Company at the time noticed uh, some of my writing getting published and so forth. And he invited me over to ABC and he offered me a nice job. Uh, he put me in charge of several departments and, uh, and it was my writing that got my foot in that door. And, uh, and it's so funny that, uh, I, uh, I used to write, you know, memos and things around the, you know, around the company and, uh, the founder of the company, Leonard Goldson, uh, so, you know, saw, recognized it and called me in his office and, and we got to know each other. And I worked with other top executives there, Fred Pierce, in other words. And then uh, there was another executive there that also noticed my writing skills. And uh, and uh, uh, and this was uh, a guy who would become very big later on in my life that I'll tell you about. But anyway, Leonard Goldenson... Uh, was uh, uh, scheduled to appear on some television shows, popular television shows, and he said, "You know, I, I don't, I don't like to be on that side of the camera. I like to be behind the camera. I, you know, I'm, I'm the founder here." And I said, "Well, Leonard, let, let me create the show for you, uh, and 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 give you give you some runs uh, through it, and let's see if we can't get you more comfortable." And I would do this for Leonard Goldson, and he wound up being very good, very effective on camera. And then I talked to Fred Pierce. He was the head of, uh, you know, all, all the television uh, series and everything. And, and Fred had a reputation of being unfriendly with the media because he really didn't like the media. They were always prying, and they were, they were, they were, they were, they were, they were nasty, some of them, and tough questions. And uh, and I said, Fred, let me try something. First of all, I, I want you to stop wearing these dark clothes. Can you wear lighter clothes, please? And can you do me a favor? Can you just smile? <laughs> just just <laughs> smile. Well. Just yeah. smile. And, and why should I smile? I mean, these people are putting me through the rigors. I said, look. Think of them as children. They don't know what they're doing. They don't know what they're saying. And you know what you say? You say, no, Johnny, you don't do that. That's not good for you to do. And with a smile on your face. Yeah. And anyway, I changed his wardrobe. I got him smiling. I got him being really friendly with even adversarial questioning. I changed his personality. Even his wife wrote to me and said, you know, he, he's even different at home. I said, no kidding. Well, isn't that wonderful? So, and that's what I got a reputation doing. Uh, and then when... Well, let me ask you this. What is it about you that can talk to a big executive like that and convince them that this is what the best approach would be moving forward? Because a lot of people are afraid to do that. Well, you got you got to find a uh, you know a, a reason that's going to you know uh, strike home, and you know this this executive had had young children, and I told him I said you know you know when your son you know your little boy if he if he says something you know really doesn't make any sense and everything you don't scold him, you you correct you correct him, but don't you do it in a friendly way, and that's the way you should treat the media. Be, be friendly with them. And you know something? They'll be tempted to be friendly with you. Okay? When you when you confront a smile, sometimes that brings out your own smile. Anyway, it just rung a, a truth road for these people that I'm advising. And if it's if they see the wisdom of it and they adopt it and it works, then I've got a convert. Okay, and that's how it works. Yeah. Well, something that I like to do is I like to ask kind of uh, these lightning round questions where I ask you a short question and you give me an answer. And sure. can I run through a couple of those? Because there, yeah, these are yeah, some things ahead. that I, I know a little bit about you. And uh, I know that the one thing that, that you've said is that 
uh, your friends would like to get more of your time and they would like to see you out of the office and on the golf course, but it doesn't look as though you've done much of that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> why, 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 how do you make that? How do you come to that conclusion? <laughs> because of something that you wrote. You oh, said, okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. So what's the question? When you're, when you're, uh, you know, you've been working and toiling away and, I uh, and, you know, any, anything you do in the office or at least away from your social life, let's assume it's work. I mean, there are other things, but let's, but other than with your lovely wife and your, your great daughter, but, uh, when you are uh, spending too much time away from your friends and they're trying to pull you out of your work at your, you know, uh, illustrious age, you you would not necessarily rather be on the golf course. Maybe you'd rather be working. How do you gracefully tell your friends no? Well, most of my my friends who really know me uh, know I don't play golf, uh, and and they know that I'm really into uh, what I do. So they sort of tiptoe around that, you know. And, and I don't I don't get these uh, either or type situations, uh, and, and they know who I am, and, um, and 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 they're comfortable with it, and I and I and I make no no, no fuss about it either. I mean I. I, uh, you know, I, I am sort of kind of a workaholic, I guess you would call it, but I, I do like to spend a lot of time at what I do because I enjoy what I do. And and people realize that and they, it doesn't seem to bother anybody. <clears throat> now, my sphere of friendship has kind of like, you know, has diminished a little bit over the years. I used to know a lot more people. And I used to take people to lunch all the time. You know, those are the days when, uh, you know, you wanted to impress a, a reporter with a story. You took them to lunch. Today, forget it. You know, it's just uh, an email or a text or something, and you never probably even see the other person. Uh, so th those days are gone. But uh, I was very social in those days. And what I do is essentially social. I mean, I'm not into raw science here. I'm into trying to be make sense. I'm trying to be friendly. I'm I'm trying to look at things uh, positively, and, and th th these don't run against uh, sociality. I mean, the social scene. I mean, they they're right in keeping with it. And occasionally we go to a party. I, I was at a seder last night, and uh, it was wonderful. It was with a quite a group of people and I enjoyed them and they, and I hope they enjoyed my 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 presence and and it was fun uh, I still know how to have a good time and uh, I don't see it there's not really a conflict uh, at all here in what I do and how I live and uh, and, and and the friends that I have and uh, and and it, it all starts, sort of blends together. Now, how do you look at uh, the word or what it means to be retired? Oh, oh, oh yeah, <laughs> that's that is a dreadful word. And as a matter of fact, I have a client, uh, Nancy Height. She's a uh, financial advisor, and I helped her write a book. In fact, I gave her the title for the book. Retirement is a mirage. That's retirement title. is a mirage. Okay, mm -hmm. it's it's a it's a falsehood. It's a it's a dangerous track to be on. Uh, you need and and her book is about the need to stay active. Okay, maybe you're not doing the same job you you were doing, you know, when, when you were younger or whatever, but you still have to find that job or something similar and keep your brain uh, working. And, you know, and I, I live in a condo on a beach front here in, in uh, South uh, Florida. And I see people who are, quote, retired 
and it's not helping them health-wise, mentally, uh, in, 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 even in their own dispositions. I mean, it, it's it's a dangerous uh, uh, it's a dangerous thing to adopt. In other words, to retire. So I, I'm against retirement, and I expect to be working till the very, very last, you know, keystroke. And that's why I think that that's the best thing. And we ought to get rid of this term retirement. Uh, it's just not a healthy term, and it's not a good uh, quest to pursue. It's a mirage. Let me ask you an, another question. Uh, people are at uh, this point in life, they... Uh, I, w I won't use the word they're retired after what you just said. Maybe I'll have to look for another <laughs> better word, but they want to travel the world. And there are opportunities to travel in some countries that uh, that we're warning, uh, that are warned of, 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 of warnings for travel due to crime and terrorism. And uh, they, they, they put out these travel alerts but they still become a popular place. So my um, one of the stories today on the on the show is a couple uh, in, in uh, one is 67, another is 75, and they are uh, heading to Colombia, which is uh, one of the places that often gets travel warnings. Um, is that uh, a safe thing to do? Well, yeah, I, 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 you know, travel is, uh, you know, I've always loved to travel. Uh, I've been to Europe countless times. Uh, uh, I've even been to Moscow, uh, you know, and uh, I won't go there now. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, you know, but I love, I love travel. I've been to Italy so many times. Uh, in fact, I even lived in Italy for a while uh, when I was first married. And uh, it, it's so wonderful to be in, you know, in a different space uh, and and hearing another language and, and different customs. It, it, it's really edifying and stimulating. So I, I would recommend travel. Uh, now, lately, with the COVID and everything, uh, my travel has sort of come to a screeching halt. I, I, I've stayed away from airplanes now uh, for a couple of years. Uh, and, but I hope to get back into it. My wife and I, uh, we're planning a trip to Ireland. And then, of course, she wants to get me uh, over to Brazil. I've got to meet some of her family, and her mother is still alive, and uh, and, and that would be wonderful. And I look forward to that. As a matter of fact, I had we had plane tickets to go to Brazil, just as COVID broke out, and I had to cancel the reservation because uh, we we didn't think it was safe to get on a crowded plane. But now it seems to be uh, subsiding, and and that fear is diminishing, and. Uh, and maybe we'll start traveling again because it is very stimulating. And uh, and, and it also takes your mind uh, in another direction, which is great. You know, so you can't get too bogged down in one direction. Now, I'm not nearly as uh, travel experienced as you. So if I were to read a warning of uh, a travel advisory uh, to a certain country, uh, I would probably say no. Say no, meaning you wouldn't go to that country? Yeah. Yeah, I agree with you. I mean, uh, you know, I certainly, you know, seeing, uh, you know, this this young journalist, uh, you know, arrested in, 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 in Moscow, uh, you know, it, it's certainly, there are certainly places that are very unsafe. Um, you know, and I'm not sure... It would be, I'd want to be walking around Ukraine uh, and some of these other war-torn countries, and uh, you know. But uh, but I am working with, by the way, a Ukrainian community here, and uh, and I ha I am corresponding with uh, the president there, and I'm uh, I I'm I'm hoping some of my ideas. Uh, it might reach a court here, and if necessary, I'll travel there if I if I if I if I have to 
uh, do the ultimate uh, crisis management because that poor country is just being tormented. And uh, boy, if we could just bring some sense into Putin and uh, and bring some peace into that ravaged land, uh, that would be a great achievement. I would call that the ultimate crisis management. It would be. I would. The... Uh... What I I recently traveled uh, to a wedding in Tulum, Mexico, and uh, then later after we, I got back, I heard about some of the uh, some of the gang violence and uh, the cartels and all of that. So uh, I it, it scares me. Oh, yeah. there, there, there's many places in this world that. Uh... Thank you. I can't hear you too well. Wise to try travel to at this, especially. I'm sorry. Say that again. There are there are certainly places in this world. It's probably not wise to to visit at at this time, uh, because uh, you know uh, there there is there there are dangers lurking, and uh, and we Americans, uh, you know, are are for a lot of uh, the anti-Americans, uh, we are targets. And uh, that's it's not not a healthy, you know, road to go down when you're uh, when it's known that uh, you're you're uh, an American. Uh, now, in some places, Americans are, are appreciated and other places they're despised. Speaking about uh, world uh, affairs, um, I know one of the taught one of the ideas you're working on with a, a friend or a client is a uh, uh and, and this comes with all of the heat that TikTok is getting from congress and then i understand you're helping a friend uh create something that might even create more problems for TikTok. i mean is that for real that's true um I, I think that uh, you know there's an inherent value in in, in TikTok, uh, TikTok, and uh, obviously that's made it uh, a supreme kind of a service and reaching billion people. And in shortly, uh, it's it's already in Florida. It's banned in the universities, and it soon may be banned throughout America because of the snooping behind it by uh, you know the Chinese. So there are there are, you know there are problems with it and inherent risks uh, uh, you know to our to to us uh, in this kind of a of a, of, a, of a platform. So I've come up with a with a with a with another version of it, which hopefully will replace it. That's a big goal. I <laughs> want to be part of that. <laughs> it's a very big goal, but I have some very big-minded people, including uh, a client of mine who is a very very astute, prominent attorney, Peter Tickton. And Peter is a client of our of our firm for, for many years, and, uh, and we've grown to really appreciate each other. And uh, and he is uh, Donald Trump's personal attorney. And the reason he's close to Donald Trump is that they were cadets together in high school, where where they attended the New York Military Academy. And Peter actually wrote a book about it. Uh, titled "What Makes Trump Tick," what makes Trump tick, and uh, you know, so they have a, a close, long personal relationship, and uh, and you know, and he's like many on the right are very, uh, uh, very upset about you know this latest indictment uh, of the former president, you know. Uh, you, you 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 know try not looking at it too politically but just simply for what it is and what it's trying to do uh i've created a a tiktok kind of atmosphere to to react to that story and 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 you know and, and he has the perfect name for it because i now i call this Tickton talk. His name is Tickton, and I just uh, put a talk next to it. 
So it's Tickman talk. And it, it, just like TikTok itself, that's that's oriented to mostly young people, and it's kind of fun and crazy and you know, and not too scripted. And, you know, I tried to do something along the same lines, only dealing with the subject of this latest indictment of the president. But do it in a way that's kind of fun and satiric and comic. And uh, and I have ticked in doing some really weird things here and, and talking about the prosecutor at New York and, all, and and so forth and I I have him in a in a ring uh, and he's trying to make the, the, the taking the position that it's the politically driven indictment now others listen there are a lot of people who don't like Trump and I can understand some of their feelings and so forth there are others who think that Trump is being harassed unfairly so I mean I don't I don't adopt either one of these positions. I just uh, try to explain a certain view, and and this view is that uh, this has been an unfair uh, indictment and politically driven and so forth. And I, I, but when you see the you when you see this thing, even even those who are anti-Trump will laugh because there's some funny stuff in the, in the thing. And that's what it's meant to be. And I have ticked in in boxing gloves in a, in a, in a prize fighting ring, you know, <laughs> like, you know, like saying this is this is what politics is all about, you know, and and then defining it in, in those terms and so forth. And so I think the presentation, it's only about a five minute film. But uh, and I'll send I'll send you a copy when it's done. But uh, I think it's going to be very disarming for those who are not friendly towards Trump, and yet there's and the others are going to get such a laugh out of it and such a you know they're going to enjoy it, and so and I and I and I think that maybe it might be the start of a new kind of uh, TikTok for grownups. Uh, so I will be looking for it. Uh, I haven't yet gotten into TikTok, uh, so uh, I will uh, just jump right over at and look for you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. I think you'll get you'll get a chuckle out of it, and uh, Tickton does a good job, and uh, and I must say it's very well written. Because guess who the writer is? <laughs> I'm sure it would only be well written from, with, from you. Now tell me this: you have the latter story. Tell me about uh, your daughter's warning, so that she tells you that uh, to stay off the ladder. In a, in a, in effect. What's okay. what's the latter story? Well, the, the latter story is that uh, we we occasionally we have this this company uh, and uh, you know that provides a a simpler easier way to install uh, 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 lighting in your home and uh, and and you know they asked us to. Because it, what it what it what it's all about is that the more time you spend on a ladder, the more dangerous it, it is because you could get maybe electric shock, or you could lose your balance, or or whatever it is. And and ladder falls are injuring and killing people by the thousands and thousands every, every year. It's very very common to have a ladder fall and have an injury, maybe a death. So, uh, you know, so I'm, I'm trying to bring attention uh, to this to this company. And uh, at the same time, uh, trying to make it fun and, and interesting. And also, I rounded up all these statistics about ladder falls. And, uh, and, and, you know, and I think it's going to impress a lot of people because we don't realize what risk we're taking when we climb up these ladders to do whatever it is we're doing on the ladder. Yeah, they can be dangerous. I don't like ladders one bit. I try to stay off of them <laughs> whenever I can. Yeah. For folks, uh, and maybe this is uh, what I ask guests 
uh, not all the time, but if there was a takeaway uh, for this conversation that we are having today, if there was a takeaway that people could learn by it, you know, your peers and so forth, uh, would there be one that you, maybe you could share with us? Well, I, 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 I like, uh, I like perseverance. Um, I think that maybe, you know, a lot of us, you know, give up too soon and uh on certain quests and uh and i i'm sort of more driven and uh and i kind of stay with things because i know that uh, let me give you an example as i was a newspaper reporter once uh, you know at the philadelphia Inquirer, and i i learned there that risks when you take them sometimes pay off in huge results and I, I was covering uh, one of the first uh, skyjackings uh, at, the, at the airport, and the editor sent me out to the airport. They were uh, they had uh, corralled all the passengers who had been on this uh, a skyjacked airplane, and the FBI was interviewing them all, and they wouldn't allow the press into it. And I was one of many reporters who was blocked from getting at these passengers who were telling this the story about the skyjacker. And this was a unique experience at the time. It's one of the early skyjackings. And they brought, got the plane down, they arrested the guy and so forth. And, uh, but now they were hearing about uh, what it was like, you know, for all the passengers. And I was being blocked from this great Oh, story. really? Is that right? I was being blocked. So what I did was, I saw I saw somebody coming uh, uh, through the press block lines, you know, where the press were had the barricade, and uh, he was uh, he, he was bringing in some some food and some and coffee for the uh, for the passengers. So I rushed into the uh, restroom, and uh, I uh, 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 I saw a guy with with bringing cups of coffee, and I said, "I'll take those in." And I took my clothes, I took my shirt off, and I, my, I had a suit jacket on, a tie, I took it off. And I take the coffees from this uh, this this waiter, this deliverer, and I went to the barricades and I said, coffee for the for the pastures. Oh, okay, all right. Then, then, then. So I got in there and I started to pour coffee for the pastures and interviewing them while I was doing it. And I got the story of my life front page about all the personal stories about this skyjacker, what he did, what he said, how it did, what, how they felt. And if I didn't take that risk, I probably could have been arrested. If I didn't take that risk, I would have never gotten that story. That is sunk into my brain for the rest of my life. There are certain things you have to take some risks on, and sometimes they're worth it. Okay? And that's that's one of the things I'd like to leave with your audience. Well, good story. And uh, maybe just this final question: uh, What's what's uh, next, or what's uh, what's big uh, for Thomas Madden in the next uh, couple of weeks or months ahead? <laughs> <laughs> well, I would say it's everything I do. There's a certain element of risk to it. I mean, I can, you know, I'm. Uh, and and I and I uh, and I have a, a number of things uh, in the works. Not the least of which is this uh, TikTok, uh, uh, you know, uh, knockoff. Uh, and uh, you know, and I I just I like to just keep coming up with those ideas. Uh, my, the biggest fear I have is uh, I'm going to someday you know I'm not going to have an idea, but I always have ideas. And they keep coming, and I love to execute them. And then, uh, I, and some of them have wonderful, uh, you know, rewards to them. Uh, wonderful, you know, uh, things that are that 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 reward you for the risk you take. Uh, and I and I and that, that to me is, is 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 so much part of life and makes life so much fun. Well, I can't tell you how much of an inspiration that is. Uh, so uh, I couldn't leave it at a better point. Thanks so much, <laughs> Tom. I appreciate that. Okay, and it was great to talk to you. I enjoy your your. I like your style too. <laughs> <laughs>